Well, good morning, Lipscomb. It's great to be here and have you assembled and to praise together and to have a, a moment for our community. Down in the legislature, which is just a couple of miles away, there's a custom, and the custom is one that says, while we have a lot of business to do, and while that's the focus of the legislature getting together to work for the people, every member of that legislature has the opportunity, at least occasionally, to take a moment of personal privilege. And I'd like, before we go to the word this morning, uh, to take just a moment of personal privilege. Uh, it was about seven and a half years ago that I was speaking in this Allen Arena as the inauguration took place for uh, this president and this administration. And when that occurred, I was so pleased to have my 85-year-old father come all the way from Portland, Oregon to be in that audience. I really didn't know if he would ever be back. But uh, my point of personal privilege today is to introduce to you my Nile, now 93-year-old father, uh, who is here for uh, all the chapels that he missed when he was in college, uh, and uh, to soak up this moment where we gather together, would you welcome from Portland, Oregon, Lloyd Lowry. He's had a number of experiences the last eight weeks here in Tennessee. Uh, we went down and had lunch the other day, a great time in Leaper's Fork at Puckett's Grocery. Uh, we had Christmas together for the first time in a number of years, and he celebrated it with some of his children and some of his grandchildren and some of his great-grandchildren. But what a moment he has now to take back your singing, your praise, this assembly, and especially the words to that last song. Uh, as he looks forward to the rest of his life. I want to take you back to 1967. And where I want to take you is to Redlands, California. In fact, I want to take you more specifically to Redlands High School. And as I take you there, I want you to imagine you're walking in with me when I was 16 years old, uh, as a sophomore, the first year in high school, as they do it out there. And in my class, my speech and debate class, I met my teacher for the very first time. Her name, Gertrude Backus. And as I walked into that classroom, I saw that rather stern look on her face. Uh, and I figured the name Backus sounded kind of German and she acted somewhat like a stereotype might be. She was about as wide as she was tall. Uh, she didn't know how to walk. She just kind of marched around the room. And I realized in a few minutes that this speech and debate class would be very, very different. She was not one that was very concerned about how popular she was or how liked she was by students. She wasn't too concerned that she be cool or that she connect. She had a job to do and she was going to do it. And I never will forget some of the first words she said. She looked at us as 16-year-old kids in high school and said this. She said, most of you are not tough enough to stay with me. Most of you are not tough enough to stay with me, but if you do, I will change your life. Those are pretty heady words. What do you do in your first class, in the first semester, in your first moment in high school when that message comes across? Well, well, you've heard it before. You've heard something like that from your teachers or from your coaches or from your mentors or from your parents. And you know that in there is a challenge. And the challenge is, are we willing to let this experience we call education transform us? Are we willing to grow and to develop and be a part of what can change our lives? You're making an enormous investment. You're spending four years of your time. You're investing an untold number of dollars. You're taking time from what you otherwise could be doing and saying, here I am in college. And I want you to think about that, not just as an educational experience, but as a transforming experience. 
The Apostle Paul talked about that in a little bit broader way. In Romans 12, he talked about that in terms of maybe the canvas of life. And he said, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I like this translation of that same passage. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good. It meets all of his demands. It moves toward the goal of true maturity. The Apostle Paul helped us understand in the verses around this that there are some contrasts in the choices we'll make. We will either choose evil or we will choose good. We will either choose what is harmful to us or what is healthy for us. We will either choose to be self-centered or we will choose to be other-centered. We will either choose to take from this life or to give to this life. You know, most people think a university is all about information, and at one time it probably was. At one time you stood in a classroom or sat there, the professor stood in front of you and in 50-minute segments gave you information. Occasionally we tested you and then four years later gave you a degree. It's no longer about information. Oh, with the technology you hold in your hand right now, and with that technology, you have access to more information than your faculty at this university will ever read. It's not about information, it's about transformation. And you know, it's kind of interesting because you came here, whether it was a year or two or three ago, you came here as a consumer. I say this often at graduation, you came as a consumer. You looked at Samford and you looked at Harding and you looked at Belmont, you looked at the University of Kentucky and the University of Alabama and the University of Tennessee. And somewhere along the line in that senior year of your life, you, you did that search and finally said, this is the university, this is the community, here is where I want to be. You chose us as a consumer. And that's kind of like going to Target. You go to Target as a consumer. And when you go to Target as a consumer, you don't become what Target is. You buy milk or buy jewelry or buy clothes and leave the store. But in higher education, it's different because you come as a consumer, but you leave as our product. Well, not necessarily like that. Uh, you don't leave looking like that, but you leave part of this bison herd, this bison community. And when you walk across the, the stage at graduation, you have become something because you were here. It's a transforming experience when it works. And when we do our jobs really, really well, you undergo change and development and transformation. That's the business that we're in. Well, let's think for just a couple of moments this morning about transformation and how it's going on in our community around us and through us. Obviously, we are transforming our campus, and I want to give you just a glimpse of what has been done and what is to be done in the next number of months. The last seven years, we've invested $70 million in this campus. Recently, we've redone Elam, and I hope those of you that are there for the first year are enjoying the investment last summer and looking forward to other things we'll be doing. We've improved the Student Rec Center and invest in that every single summer. The bookstore is brand new. The Campus Center has been transformed. Those of you in the health sciences and nursing know that you study in literally the most sophisticated and technology-equipped learning environment for nursing in Middle Tennessee. Underway are improvements in the library. You've seen that we started construction in the pharmacy research building. And as we move forward this spring, we will redo Bison Square with a brand new fountain as the centerpiece of that project. We're moving on to McFarland to new undergraduate science labs and to set that building off in a different way on Belmont. Swang, our business building, will be brought forward to the 21st century with a complete renovation. Shortly, we'll start a new building in civil engineering. 
a new building with wellness where your medical clinic and counseling services and pharmacy will all be located. And yes, I have remembered it. We have a plan for parking. But the purpose of the physical transformation is not just so we say, well, boy, don't we have a nice campus? Don't people who drive by really look at it? The reality is this is where things happen. We build the buildings and equip the labs and, and, and find the parking and all of that so that on this campus something can happen. Some of you, while you're here, will set records in athletics. Some of you will find that this is where you commit to a new and deeper faith. Hopefully all of you will find a major that leads to a career. All of you will find relationships that last for the end of your life. And so we build the campus not just for the enjoyment, but because it's a vehicle for transformation. We're also transforming our community. Lipscomb is an amazing community. When you look around at uh, your student body now, uh, this year, almost 19% of this student body are students who represent minority, either ethnically or culturally, minority groups. And that's a change for this university. It's a change for a university in the South. In the last year or so, we've been among the top two or three schools in Tennessee in terms of our ethnic diversity. And we welcome you as you bring your culture and your background, your customs uh, and, and your values to this community. We have a lot of non-traditional students. In fact, almost half of our students uh, don't live in the dorms and fit into that normal pattern. And so we reach out to adult students who have not gotten a college degree. Uh, we think about graduate students and have almost 1,600 now. We have veterans who have fought uh, across the world and on and on. But the student body is now made up of people who, who have a different set of experiences. And religiously, that's true as well. Where at one time Lipscomb was a Church of Christ school, not only in terms of its heritage and orientation, it was that in terms of its student. But today, Church of Christ students are no longer the majority of this student body. And we embrace that heritage. We embrace the heritage that says we're going to take a high view of Scripture. We embrace the heritage that says we're going to serve literally around the world. We honor those people who have spent decades building this institution for you. But we also are thankful that God brought you to be a part of this story. And you bring your traditions and you bring your backgrounds and together, like we did just a few moments ago, we lift ourselves in a sacrifice of praise. But we don't do that just for statistics. We do that so that you can be transformed as you get ready to enter a world that itself will demand your ability to work cross-culturally, to understand different backgrounds, to be, sympathy, to be sympathetic, to be empathetic. We do it so when we leave here, uh, our message and our work is more powerful. We also are transforming our quality. This university has a long tradition of doing things very, very well. Its reputation for decades has been creating tremendous accountants and great teachers and, and wonderful doctors, and the list goes on and on and on. But we have to think about the call to be absolutely excellent all the time. And I am so pleased that this university, I believe, is moving to the very top of its game. A few weeks ago, I was with a parent whose son just signed to play golf here next year. She's from a different city, from Chattanooga. And she said, you know, when my son signed to play golf at Lipscomb, I was excited, but I didn't know what my friends would think. And there in Chattanooga, she said, the very first people I told that my son was going to Lipscomb said the very same thing. They both said, that's an outstanding school. They produce great people in the health sciences. And she said, even though I'm thrilled he's coming to play golf, I'm more thrilled that your reputation is of a fine academic institution. And so I wanted to pause just a moment and let us celebrate this morning those that are helping move to the top of our game. 
This year, we hired 42 new faculty members. What that really means is an investment this year of about $3 million, but it means over the life of their teaching at Lipscomb, a commitment to spend more than $90 million so that you can have some of the finest professors in the country. Those of you who are new to the school this year brought to this school your outstanding academic records. You are presidential scholars and you are trustee scholars. You are Phi Theta Kappa scholars. You are national merit finalists. You are allowing us to have in this student body the capability of doing greater things academically. And we have some people who are here today and some who are not, but, but they are doing outstanding things. And I want you just to, to pause for a moment and, and reflect and allow us to introduce them. Dean Candace McQueen is the Dean of our College of Education. In 2011, just a year ago, the state of Tennessee looked at all the schools in the state that educate teachers. Lipscomb University was the top university in the state in the terms of preparing teachers and having an impact on their classroom. Candace has worked very hard to build a brand, uh, a brand new College of Education. Would you allow us, Candace, to thank you for that? The organization Boy Scouts of America is a large organization involving millions of young people in scouting. It's exciting that as we have invited Eagle Scouts to be a part of this university, uh, we have one that has now accepted because of the popularity and the vote of his colleagues, the position as the National Chief of the Order of the Arrow, the top Boy Scout in the nation. Would you please welcome your colleague, Matt Brown? Not here this morning is Professor Beth Youngblood, recently recognized uh, as the top nurse of the year in the state of Tennessee by the March of Dimes. The top nurse in the state of Tennessee by the March of Dimes. We celebrate her. Here this morning is Professor Mike Fernandez. Professor Fernandez came to us from Texas several years ago and took our theater department and literally has put it on the map. And while you were gone in December, uh, they looked at what we were doing and voted his theater company the best theater company, voted the play Red that they did in the fall the number one play in Nashville, and voted Mike Fernandez the number one director. Would you please thank Mike? <laughs> Anna Cobb, who is not with us, joins Beth Youngblood, not as the uh, nurse of the year, but, but joins as the student nurse of the year, uh, we're thrilled that we walked away with both of those honors. And finally, Ben Minza. Many of you know Ben. Uh, ben is one of our veteran students, lost both of his legs in Afghanistan. What you may or may not know is that this is someone who has a tremendous sense of courage. Here's someone who has a tremendous sense of service. The summer before he enrolled at Lipscomb, he rode his wheelchair bicycle from Florida to California. He raised over $90,000 for people like him, wounded veterans. We're so proud of Ben. And the list could go on and on, but you get the point. We're working, we're transforming the institution in terms of its quality, not just for recognition, although that's nice when it comes, we're transforming it because quality is what we are called to be. We are stewards of our talent, and God says don't bury your talent in the dirt, but use your talent and multiply it. That's why quality is important. And finally this morning, we are transforming our impact. I think there's a mistaken impression that what this thing is all about is that you are here to get an education. And we're going to give you an education because that's our job, but that's not, I think, why you're here. The much more profound reason for being at this university is because you're getting ready to impact the world. 
you're going to join 36,000 other alumni who are already and already doing that, and you're going to join them, and I can't begin to explain or predict what you will do, but I want you to think about this as preparation to impact the world. You may be like the Honorable Beth Harwell, who is the speaker of our House of Representatives in Tennessee, and I believe has a great shot at being our next governor. You may be like Ed Du Okori, who's the founder of the, Nash, the Nigerian Christian Academy. Three hours from most anything that we would call civilization, no mail service, no internet service, no telephone, but here he is building a, a campus of 12 different buildings because of his heart for the Lord and his heart for education. You may be like David Sampson, served in the Bush administration as the Deputy Secretary of Commerce. You may be like Michael Shane Neal, one of the finest portrait artists in the world, who recently finished the portrait of Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and also actor Morgan Freeman. You may be like Dr. Mike Adams, the only person I know of that has transitioned from being a bison into a bulldog but he's president of the University of Georgia and he's one of your alumni colleagues. Or Dr. Gene Anderson, who from Johns Hopkins University uh, has led the nation in HIV care for women. Or Dr. Paul Jean, head of the UN Information and Technical Corps. Here's his job, think about it. He's got till the end of this year to place 500,000 computers in 10,000 schools so that 35 million students will have access and do that in 60 nations. Now, what's my purpose in telling you that? My purpose is to say that the problems of the world are too great and the needs are too large and the demands are too extreme for us to think about education only in the context of getting so many credits and walking across that stage. I hope that you will think about education as something that prepares you literally to change the world. Now we've got to acknowledge a couple of things. We've got to acknowledge that transformation, our transformation to do something great like that demands, well, it demands some real radical change. In fact, the Apostle Paul in that same passage helped us understand how different we should be. He gave to us values that are foreign to us when he said, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And on and on it goes. And if you read the passage, you begin to realize the transformation I'm called to is a radical transformation because the values of this life are so different from the values of the world. Transformation is also hard work. I was with a wonderful neurosurgeon from Vanderbilt who was a Lipscomb graduate and I said, you know, how'd you get there? How did you accomplish the sense of becoming one of the finest neurosurgeons in our entire region of the country? He said it was really simple. He said when my friends went out, I went to the library. Not complicated at all. It takes hard work to transform. The last thing about transformation, though, that I think is so interesting is that when we're in the midst of it, sometimes we can't see what the outcome's going to be. We don't know from this vantage point, even though we're committed to it and doing those things to achieve it, we don't know what it's going to be like. And so let me take you back to Redlands, California. Let me take you back and share with you the rest of the story. Mrs. Bacchus was my high school speech and debate coach. And as life would have it, my mother and Mrs. Bacchus became friends. And after Mr. Bacchus died, we really were, in a sense, her close friends and caretaker. 
I was there the day that we moved her out of her home into an assisted living apartment. And I remember the conversation where she said, I will not leave unless someone takes care of Dr. Backus's papers. And for years, they were in my garage. I remember when she got older and more feeble, the day that I was there and said, Mrs. Backus, we have to go from assisted living because you need a higher degree of care. And I wheeled her wheelchair into a nursing facility. And as life would have it, when she died, I was the one called upon to do her funeral. How do you do that? How do you do a funeral, which is really just a whole collection of words, how do you do a collection of words for your speech teacher? Well, I don't know if she could look down from heaven and see what was going on or not, but I felt a certain amount of pressure. This one needed to go well. And so the week before the memorial service, I called a number of her friends, a number of my friends and, and her students, and I just called and said, I don't know if you've heard Mrs. Backus died. We're going to celebrate her life at 2 o'clock on Saturday. I made a number of telephone calls. One of the people I called was a colleague, a student who was a year behind me, by the name of Chris Myers. I called Chris on the phone and I said, Chris, you probably don't remember me. My name's Randy. I was in speech with Mrs. Backus. Uh, she died. I just thought you'd like to know about that. And I was surprised by his response. Because literally, his response on the phone was this. I hated her. <laughs> Whoa. What do you say? I said, well, okay, Chris, I just thought you'd like to know she died. I hated her. Well, okay, Chris, I mean, I don't want to get involved in this. Uh, I hated her. He said, I signed up for a class and then I quit. I signed up again and I quit. I signed up again and I quit. I hated her. I said, well, then you probably don't want to know about the funeral at 2 o'clock on Saturday. No, I don't care about the funeral. Thank you, Chris. Been great to renew our relationship. <laughs> right? And I hung up the phone. A couple of days later, Chris called me. I said, hi, this is Randy. Hi, this is Chris. He said, now, when is that funeral? I said, it's 2 o'clock on Saturday. He said, I'm not coming. I hated her. I said, okay, don't come. And so he hung up. It's now 2 o'clock on Saturday. And I'm greeting people as they're coming in, and this big guy comes in and sticks out his hand. I don't recognize him at all. It's been 30 years. He said, hi, I'm Chris Meyer. And we shook hands. He said, I was driving to Palm Springs, didn't intend to come to the funeral, didn't even have clothes that were right for a funeral. I had to stop and buy some clothes, but, but here I am. But he said, I'm not talking. I said, well, that's probably better. Uh, that really is. Probably a good, good thing there. He said, I'm not talking. I'm just going to sit in the back. I said, fine, Chris. Now, they do funerals a little different in California. Often we have this moment where you invite anybody in the audience to say anything they want to say. And so at the end of the service, I said, you know, are any of you out there wanting to say something? Come up and share about Mrs. Backus. And some people came up and shared. And then I'm about to wrap things up. And all of a sudden, Chris stands up and starts walking forward. And I'm thinking to myself, Mrs. Backus, please forgive me. I worked hard. I did my best. But this is going to be a mess. And he walks up and he grabs the podium. He looks out at this audience gathered to honor her, and he says, I hated her. <laughs> and then he kept talking. And as he kept talking, he said, I hated her. He said, you know, every time she was in my face, every time she was demanding, every time she wouldn't let go, I quit her class twice. And then I went back. And he said, this week it has haunted me all week long because I am a successful lawyer, I am a successful real estate developer, and I think back in my life at who influenced me, and it was her. And so in the most tender moment of the entire memorial service, he looked out over that audience and said, this is Bacchus. I love you. I love you.
May God bless you as you seek to be transformed and as you get ready to impact the world.